Well, good. Um, yeah, this is a huge question, and I'm not sure I'll answer it, but we'll, we'll see. Um, thanks for having me. Today is a celebration, and we use say celebration, I think. Okay. Um, so you can't really see that this well, but actually what you see on this photo is uh, me, or at least a younger version of me. I think I look quite a bit younger than I do today. It's actually, um, I will not say how many years ago this was, because I'm a lady and I'm lady now as close to this information. But um, this is actually shockingly few number of years ago, uh, given that I look quite young. But um, what you also see here is the best cake ever. So why is this such a great cake, I think? What you see on this cake is an artist's depiction of uh, a black hole binary system. You see that here, here. So two black holes in a binary circling around each other in the spiraling. And because we know that um, matter tells space-time how to curve, curves space-time, and what travels outwards is gravitational wave. Um, and so that's really kind of a very cool um, result of like uh, general relativity, and uh, something that was actually first detected uh, a few number uh, of years ago, and I think it was actually one of the most groundbreaking, groundbreaking discoveries um, in science is in the last decade. And so the other reason this cake is so uh, phenomenal is that it was made of chocolate and peanut butter, um, undisputably the, be the best flavors uh, there are. <laughs> okay, so um, let me just talk about gravitational wave science for a little bit. So as I said, um, gravitational waves were first detected in uh, 2015. So this is actually my brother's 21st birthday. It's the first ob observation of the black hole binary system and um, gravitational waves resulting from that very, very far away. And it was detected by the LIGO and Virgo, or the LIGO collaboration at that point, actually, um, in 2015. Since, there have been many more observation runs. There was a one and a two, the first two observation runs in which there were black hole binary systems that were discovered, and also the first uh, binary neutral star merger. So you can see that, that that one took a lot longer to merge, uh, and was observed for much longer. And uh, actually, we're now working with a much larger catalog, a growing catalog of events. There was first uh, the gravitational wave transient catalog one. See so here all these different systems merging. Then that was superseded by the second catalog. And what we're now working with actually is the uh, third gravitational wave uh, transient catalog. And we've got all of these different optics that we can see um, through that gravitational radiation as they inspire each other and as they merge. So what we see here in particular, what we see is here you have like um, the mass of these objects in solar masses, so times the number of uh, masses of the sun. And so the very heaviest objects are here all, all the way in the top. So the blue objects are like the uh, binary black hole in spirals. So you see the two, uh, two objects merging into a heavier thing, a heavier black hole. Um, and the orange objects are the binary neutron star in, spir uh, in spirals, so they're a bit lighter than the black holes. And then they've got these orange and blue objects, which are kind of mystery objects, because we're not quite sure yet if they are black holes and neutron stars. For reasons, it's actually hard to find out, especially if there's a large mass ratio involved, whether or not you're dealing with a black hole or with a, with a neutron star. Um, and so you see, we've got this whole like range of objects, and um, to sort of compare like how much information there is, like how much extra information we have uh, from gravitational waves. What you also see here is like the neutron stars in green and the black holes in uh, red, respectively, have been observed through electromagnetic radiation. So not through gravitational waves. And you see that just, you know, that's kind of a guy drive. Fewer, way fewer uh, black holes. Uh, that's of course because black holes are black and they're very hard to uh, detect um, through electromagnetic radiation. The way that you can see them electromagnetically is if they're in a binary of something else, and then you can just detect from uh, the light from that other object that the black hole must have been present there. Okay. So now, actually, this is such a big castle that we can do science with it now, and that's what I find really interesting. So you can ask a few questions, uh, and you can learn many, many things from gravitational waves. So what you can ask, for example, is where do these black hole binaries come from? And I find that a fascinating question. And then you can ask what are the properties of the convex objects, so both neutron stars and black holes. And then from that, 
Ads actually you can start to answer questions about fundamental physics, including the question of like was Einstein uh, right, but also a lot of questions about particle physics and physics and extra particles. Okay, so let's take this uh, first question first. Uh, what, where do black hole black holes come from? So there's actually several ways in which you can create a black hole. The first and least controversial one, of course, is like the remnant of a very heavy star. So heavy star is like burning through chemical elements in its core, first burning through hydrogen and helium, successively heavier elements, uh, and then kind of constantly generating energy that keeps it from imploding under its own gravity. But at some point, the whole story is over, and then, you know, all this, uh, all this stuff is burned up, and uh, eventually the star will actually implode under its own gravity, and uh, the, the remnant of that is uh, a black hole or a neutron star. Now, there's another way in which you can create uh, a black hole, and that is like if something similar happens, but in the early universe, so primordial processes can also make sure that so much energy is concentrated in so little space that like uh, this, the, uh, the, this energy kind of, this mass, it implodes under its own gravity and forms a black hole. So this is kind of a bit more, um, you know, like some people believe that this would happen during the universe, others do not, so it's a little bit less, um, you know, a little bit less controversial. Um, but it's also a way in which you can form uh, a black hole. Now, again, I gave my joke already, but another way that you can form a uh, black hole, obviously, is through chocolate and peanut butter. Uh, but let's focus on this first, like, least controversial uh, way of forming a black hole first. Okay. Um, so, um, okay, let me just show you this plate, because I, I like to sort of, you know, guide the eye and think about, like, stellar evolution in terms of, like, this kind of, uh, two, these two different parameters, the temperature, the temperature of the uh, core of an object, and the density. And so, to sort of um, start off, let's just uh, start off with an object we know quite well, it's our sun. Our sun is very, very hot well and very, very dense at the core. Um, it looks here as like I have put it all the way in the, the you know, left hand corner, like left, uh, you know, lower corner of my plot, but it's actually not as dense and not as as uh, as hot in the core of our sun. But um, you know, if I just compare it to something that we are even more familiar with in our everyday life, Sir Peter Ogden. Um, <laughs> see, Sir Peter, Peter Ogden would not even be on my plot. Actually, it would be kind of you know all the way down, so around about 100 Kelvin, give or take, 300 Kelvin. <laughs> And um, about like one gram per centimeter cube in density. Um, so, so, you know, so cold relative to the core of the sun, and so uh, not dense that it would be the whole day like the bottom, the bottom over here. Okay. The star like our sun would undergo different stages in its evolution. So, actually, what, what would happen is like, you know, it, it's kind of burning through the hydrogen in its core, and later it will. Like, you know, kind of that will burn up at some point, and it will kind of evolve towards more, more dense and more hot as kind of burns through its hydrogen. At some point, it will be actually so dense in the core that it will reach like electron degeneracy, and it will just uh, at some point uh, be able to actually start to, um, start to burn through its helium amount in the helium flash, and that's over here. And then, uh, you know, it will kind of further evolve. At some point, it will just actually, uh, you know, burn, burn through uh, what it can burn through, and it Star like our sun is actually kind of light, so it will not undergo too much evolution. Some people just stop burning through, through nuclear fuel altogether and then just uh, have this in a degenerate core that cools down and is not fusing anymore. So that's a white dwarf, it's the final state, our sun. Heavier stars, though, um, actually kind of burn through progressively heavier elements in, its, in their cores. And actually, uh, these very heavy stars, and especially these stars that are the precursors of the black holes in, that you can observe through gravitational radiation, so these like 30 solar mass stars or, or, or more, so I'm interested in, actually evolve like, you know, kind of bit, like over here, and I'm going to show you a bit more of a precise plot later on, um, where they are, you know, progressively denser and more hot. Now, all the way in the top right corner here is a proton neutron star. The neutron star is very hot and dense as well. So here was electron degeneracy, here at neutron degeneracy, which is denser. And um, in the supernova explosion, you actually you know, reach these very, very high temperatures uh, and then you just cool down because you're not actually uh, fusing elements in anymore. So the first few years, it happens pretty rapidly, you cool, you cool down. Okay. 
So why is a particle physicist like yourself interested in something like this? Well, that's because like uh, these stars are actually like subatomic particle labs uh, because these temperatures these are so uh, such large temperatures that actually you should think about them as like um, photons in these stars have so much energy that they're constantly colliding, and with these energies, I can actually convert these temperatures to the energies the particles in these stars have, and, and you're actually reaching like you know, MeV, you know, to up to a uh, hundred MeV temperatures. And so you can actually start to create particles in stars. So these stellar work are like some of the particle uh, labs. So, you know, when would you be interested in doing particle physics in a star? So we like to think in particle <coughs> physics world, we like to think of like this simple plane where I have interaction strength on this uh, y axis and particle mass on this x mass uh, axis. Now, what we can do on Earth, and uh, that includes like most particles of the standard model, um, you sit somewhere here in the schematic plane. So we've got like relatively light particles, which are relatively strongly um, interacting. Um, and then there's kind of this, this other area where these are too heavy to be produced on Earth, uh, at least until we've got the, the next collider. And then we've got this like uh, sort of limiting on the on the, ver the vertical plane. Is Two weak, two weakly interactable particles to be produced on Earth, and that's where stars can help. And what you, what you would do here, like uh, I don't know, here are the dragons. Okay, so this is what I'm interested in, like relatively light particles, which are actually very weakly interacting as well. Okay, and so we're going to zoom in to this uh, part of the planet, as I said, because they're uh, here that the, uh, the black hole occurs with stars. Okay, so this is a little bit more of an exact picture of this, so this is kind of simulated, it's like based on the simulation that the collaborators did. Um, and uh, actually, like, I have these very heavy stars here, like initial masses of 120 solar masses, uh, 40 solar masses, and 70 solar masses. And so what's happening here for these very heavy stars is like they've burned through their hydrogen already, and they're starting to burn helium in their core. And so at first, what happens is like they've got these uh, reactions with Helium, so they've got two helium particles which fuse into beryllium and then capture another helium and fuse into a carbon, uh, called the triple alpha process. And then I've got this other process, um, you know, which is called uh, 12C16O, uh, very inspirationally, uh, very form of oxygen. At some point, you burn through helium as well, and when, you, when, when that happens, you actually uh, will contract even more and you get even more, and at some point, you start to be able to fuse carbon. And there are all these other reactions that take place. Now, what's interesting about this, and this is one of the things that I find interesting, uh, you know, about stellar evolution that relates to fundamental particles, is that there's actually I haven't told you yet, but it's quite there's kind of a danger zone here, and in that danger zone, if you enter your stellar trap enters the, enters the danger zone. Uh, other like you know extreme things can happen. So why is there a danger zone? Well. Uh, as I said, you know, the temperature relates to like, the energy that photons have in the interstellar plasma. And so these high temperatures of the stellar cores uh, actually allow for like electron positrons to form from photon pairs. So just you have two photons going into the interaction and the electron positron pair going out. But um, actually this process renders this kind of star unstable because what you have is Two radiation particles, photons are radiation particles, which contribute to the outward pressure of the star, converting to two particles that are kind of matter like, especially at these temperatures, because, um, and, and they actually like, uh, contribute to the gravity of the star and not to the radiation pressure. And so this is the ability to lead the star to collapse. And so that's what's happening in this danger zone. These stars enter this like regime where electron positron pairs come in the forms, but these electron positron pairs <laughs> are kind of massive particles and we the start to collapse. And so then a subsequent thing happens, and that's related to like the, the composition of the star at that point. Um, like it triggers explosive burning. So in a nutshell, what happens? I have this like massive star, the core gets so hot. And um, you know that these non-relativistic electron positron pairs are created in the plasma, and they trigger a major collapse. Then one of three things can happen. So first, first this happens that explosive, like 
I actually had oxygen in my pore, and because of this like uh, extreme contraction, this oxygen, uh, thank you, can, can trigger kind of an explosive burning cycle, and one of three things might happen. Either I have this like photodisintegration and disability triggering the immediate collapse, so I start to form a black hole. Or I actually have this like explosive oxygen burning be so powerful that it completely unbinds the star and I actually end up with nothing. Or what can happen is like um, this explosive oxygen, oxygen burning is very, very uh, strong, but it injects some of the material, but not all of it. And actually, like the star is able to kind of cool down, get, like, get into some sort of equilibrium again, then um, go through this loop actually several times. So I like electric pulse from the forms and then injection um, is, and it happens and then like more material is injected. And it, at the end of the day, you end up with a black hole, the black hole is much less massive than you would have expected. Okay, so the resulting black hole masses from these stars um, actually would look something like this. So the result of simulations again. <laughs> so here I've on the x-axis, I've got like the uh, stars in the initial masses of the stars, and here on the y-axis, also masses, so here these are red. Uh, red dots are here, kind of the final masses of the black holes. And so what you see here is like, you know, at first for these lower mass initial stars, you actually follow this line, this white dashed line, um, pretty exactly. So this is just the mass of hydrogen depletion. So this is kind of the mass, the, the initial mass minus, you know, the mass that would be lost in normal stellar processes. But eventually, at some point, you start to sort of deviate from this line and actually turn over. And that's because of this, this injection of mass that happens. Um, so these stars do not encounter instability, and these stars do encounter instability. And at some point, actually, some of these stars are completely blown apart uh, by this instability, just through partial physics processes in the core of the star. Now, um, for black holes, what is an immediate kind of consequence? Because there's an asymptote here, as you can see, and so there's actually no black holes that are formed above a certain mass, purely due to particle physics instead of force. So, um, that would, you know, that was going to lead to a mass gap in the black hole distribution, in the distribution of black holes that you can see in this, like, gravitational wave cast over. <coughs> now, um, I'm going to just, you know, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to talk quickly, I'm going to mention some new particle physics uh, processes that can happen that change this prediction, uh, you know, from the standard standard model uh, story. So you can have, like, new particles that are very weakly interacting, but not weakly, not so weakly interacting that they're not being produced. So they can be produced in the star, and then, because they interact very weakly, just free stream out. So that's something you can study. They can be produced in the star and get trapped. Uh, and that would change things in the star, we say, you know, change this kind of prediction. Um, they may collapse in the star and annihilate in the core, and they might modify other rays in the core. Um, nuclear physics can also change this type of prediction, uh, in particular, like the rates of this process, 12C16 and 12C16O. Uh, and then gravity can change this. So if like um, you know the Newton, Newton's constant is changed in the stellar uh, core, then uh, you know this process will be obviously changed uh, because like star stars are behave like they're like, less uh, less light, less heavy or heavier. Okay. So this is an example of like you know, this type of prediction being changed due to uh, new particles being formed. So this is a standard model prediction. It's a lot like I thought I showed you previously. And this is like this new particle physics model um, prediction. And you see that like this kind of mass gap arrives at much lower masses. Okay. Um, how much time do I have left? One minute. Okay. I'm going to very, very quickly tell you about how you can actually test this unit gravitational wave data. So we've got this whole catalog. This is, of course, a very nice plot to look at, but not actually something we can use for science. So what we want to use is a distribution. So mass distribution for data for this type of science. <laughs> Um, so, like, let me just tell you about the mass distribution that you expect. So, a black, like, like this type of plot is a schematic of what I can show you. You have a stellar mass and then the resulting black hole mass, and I, saw, I showed you this type of turnover, um, which can be changed due to the presence of new physics. And then, uh, how do you use data to test that? So, how can you find the gap? Um, so now, what's actually 
what's nice about this is that here you can see that there's a wide range of like stellar masses leading to a very narrow range of black hole masses, and that would lead to actually a feature in the, the distribution of masses in black holes. And so if you uh, take this plot and then uh, you know, kind of look at the distribution of black holes, then you would find you would actually get this kind of pile-up feature due to this effect here where you have this like large range and this narrow range. So that's something that you can look for, and um, you know, I'm just showing you a few kind of examples of particle physics models and what they what they would lead to. Um, yeah, and that's something that you look for in the data. Okay, running out of time, so I'm gonna conclude here. So, um, like, I think gravitational waves are a, a really interesting prediction, an exciting new opportunity in this like next um, decade to study open questions, uh, including if Einstein is right. Um, so Barry says it's a supernova that these are the supernova that he talks about. They lead to this unpopulated region in the black hole parameter space in the stellar graveyard, if you will, and that's the black hole mass gap. And so black hole population studies will allow us to study uh, stellar evolution, uh, including like fundamental questions about <laughs> particle physics. Um, and uh, so I call this black hole archaeology. Uh, thank you very much. And please ask me anything you like now or um, afterwards. I knew the undergraduates were getting younger. <laughs> okay, so I think we have time for one question. Well, as Julia says, you can ask her anything by email. That's anything, dangerous. Yeah, anything, yeah. Okay, okay, so let's thank Juno again. Oh, there's a special. I'm sorry, I didn't see you over there, Jim. So aren't there black holes found in gravitational wave sources that are in the mass gap? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So it's actually like, it's very hard to answer for an individual uh, black hole merger because like these these uh, sort of masses have like huge error bars in them. I think this is really kind of a more statistical question uh, to answer. So right now we're dealing with about 100 black holes in this uh, third observation run, but in the fourth and the fifth observation run of the LIGO third retired collaboration, we'll actually have like hundreds and hundreds of these black holes. And then you actually start to be able to do proper statistics with them and actually go, you know, where the mass gap would be. Um, but yeah, it, there were some interesting uh, observations which actually would seem to contradict with the static model uh, at this point. So it's been very exciting to see, you know, what, what we'll find in the future. Okay, great. Let's thank Juno again.